faithful with more than gold, the heart's delight. Your word gives life to all who hear and obey. Your word endures forever. Your word is true. It never changes. It formed the earth. Sustains it still. Your word defends, providing refuge and strength. Your word endures forever. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your word is a light unto my path. Death. 
reminded us in this time how fragile and fleeting life is, but we have the gift of salvation and the promise of eternal life. During lockdown, I've been encouraged by kindness that we've shown to one another. I work in a preschool and we've had to stay open, and parents have been so thankful for us. They've even made, some of them have baked brownies for us and even made masks for us. In lockdown, I'm really thankful for our wonderful growth group and the ability to support, to support and be supported. We look forward to, to seeing, seeing you all in church, church soon. soon. Bye. 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 Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's service. We're the Sneed family. I'm Sophie. I'm Stuart. I'm Jenny. And we have Will upstairs studying. So we're very thankful at the moment for our family and friends in this lockdown period. So it's challenging for a lot of us. And um, certainly we take comfort in... Um, uh, reading the Bible and connecting with our church community and friends. Um, we're grateful for the time that we've had together, that we've been able to spend as a family. And, for instance, with our family, we often play card games in the evening, which is something that we don't usually do when it's not lockdown time. We're very grateful for our family, our church family. Maybe just on a few quick words um, from from John 14. Uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. Troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Hi everyone. Hi church family, a big welcome to you today. I'm Talia and this is my lovely husband, Moose. Lovely. <laughs> it's so great to gather online with you all, especially if this is your first time joining us today. We are so stoked to have you here and we would love you to officially be a part of our church family. I don't know about you guys, but I love watching those videos mm. at the start of each week. It's so nice to see what people are up to and to see your faces. Yeah, and it's so good to see the families and particularly the kids. And now's a great segue into what we do each week. Now's a perfect time to see that QR code that's going to pop up on the screen, set the kids up in another room ready to dig into God's Word, to be shaped, renewed, and come to love and know the Lord Jesus more and more. Talia's going to pray for the kids and us as we begin this morning. Lord, we thank you that you are good through all things Thank you uh, that you've made the beautiful children of our church, Lord. Uh, be with them now. Uh, may they grow to know you, love you, and serve you. 
Uh, Lord, we also pray uh, for us remaining here in the service. May we be willing uh, and ready to listen to your word and to boldly live it out. Amen. Amen. Earlier in the, the book of Isaiah, in chapter 9, verse 2, it says this, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Those are great words, and they point forward to what we've been looking at and what we're looking at in the servant songs. And so I was reminded, in the book of Ephesians, particularly in uh, chapter 2, that all people are deserving of wrath by our very natures. But chapter 2 from verse 4 says this, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And it's that grace later on that we see in Ephesians 5 verse 8, You were once darkness, but now you are light. That's what we're going to be singing about, reminiscing about opening up a song at home in, our, in what's to follow right now, the light of your grace. Let's sing together. Sing it loud.
I love those words, in the light of your grace. I know that we can look around at the world right now and feel a little uncertain, but what a great reminder that we are living in the light of God's grace, not just now, but always. Yeah, absolutely, Tiles. We've gone from darkness to light. That's what we read about in Ephesians at the start of the service. It's only by the grace given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection, that we are saved. The best gift that you can ever receive. In light of that, in light of that great gift, why don't we say these words that are going to come up on the screen together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now to a couple of brief announcements. Uh, just remember at the end of the service, uh, you can jump onto Zoom for our Q&A session. Uh, it's going to be a great time to dig deeper into the Word. Even if you're not really in the mood or a bit nervous to ask a question, how about you jump online and be encouraged by others and have a listen? We'd also love you uh, to give us a wave and say hi to people in a different household. Yeah, absolutely. And Matt's briefly just going to give us uh, an update of where we're up to in our church partnership. And following that, we're going to get a time to come before the Lord in prayer. Jazz is going to be praying for us. And then the veils are going to be reading the Bible for us before Matt brings us the word to bear on our hearts today. So before we get into that, I want to encourage you, get out your Bibles, get out your sermon notebooks, get ready for this next section where we get to be fed by God's word. G'day, it's Michael Callahan here. I want to invite you to join a book club, one that Every uh, Tuesday at 10 o'clock, we'll be looking at a great Christian book called Gentle and Lowly. Wonderful reflection on Jesus' life. I reckon you'll get a lot out of it, and uh, it'll be a great thing for us to do together. If you're interested, just send me an email or put a note in the chat, and uh, I'll get in contact with you let you know what you need to do. Thanks. Bye. Well, I'm excited to bring to you a partnership update. Where are we? St. Martin's and St. Peter's here in August 2021. Uh, well, I firstly want to say I'm really thankful for our parish councillors, our wardens, our awesome ministry team as we've been working at this this year. Uh, the first thing to say, though, is that we're going to extend the time frame because of the challenges of COVID, of lockdown. We're going to extend the planned program for formalising our St Martin's and St Peter's partnership. And so both parish councillors have agreed to defer the formal decisions around amalgamation to next year, giving us more time to communicate, to listen consult with congregations as we bring our ministry plans uh, together. As uh, we think about how it is under God, we might see his kingdom grow. The second thing I want to say about growing partnership, at the beginning of last year, I set out the growing partnership plan. This is what we've been following this year. And uh, I just want to share where we're up to. You see, the ministry team has been developing a ministry and mission plan in the first half of the year. We've been workshopping that first with the wardens, uh, then with the parish councils from both churches. And so over the coming months, we'd like to share the specifics of the proposed ministry and mission plans with each of the congregation groups. Very hard because of COVID to do that all together. And so we're going to go into each of the congregations and groups. And we think this will be a good way for us to go. We want to hear what you think, to listen to your feedback and input so we can confirm those plans going into next year. Uh, this is what seems good, we think, uh, and we'd love to hear what you think. Uh, and Wendy Anderson and Louise McDonald will represent both parish councils. They're going to work with the ministry team and uh, with the parish councils in this communication consultation process. And what we're looking to do, God willing, once we're able to move out of lockdown, it's bold and exciting. And in broad terms, we're looking to relaunch the 8am communion service as a weekly service uh, led particularly by Michael Kellahan until February, and then our new assist senior assistant, who'll be working also across the St. Peter's Morning Congregation 
and working to develop seniors ministry at both centres. We want that to thrive and grow. Uh, Michael Freeman and a core team are going to be looking to plan a new contemporary evening congregation with kids programs and all sorts of things that, uh, that we're thinking about. Uh, with the families, we want to work at relaunching our Friday afternoon, afternoon youth and children's programs with Alex and Andrew Stanford and Moose. And uh, we want to keep growing and developing the ministry. So how are we working at that? Well, the ministry team's been developing systems and processes for moving people along the discipleship pathway. Connect, grow, serve, share, glorify. And we're, we'll now be looking to invite a rep from each, for each portfolio, for each congregation, to make up a congregational leadership team to take responsibility of driving that forward with intentionality. We're making this as measurable as possible. And so we're going to track how we're going with this. So how have we been going? Have a look at what we've seen this year. Well, at a global level across all the congregations, St. Martin's, St. Peter's and PAC, you can see that so far we were able to kind of keep things tracking along pretty steadily for the first half of the year. You can see the, the peaks around Easter and Anzac and when we've had lockdowns. And you can see too the difference it made when we relaunched the 8 a.m. service on a monthly basis. If we just look at the St. Martin's graph, the same things are reflected and you can see why we want to develop the 8 a.m. service, make that weekly again and grow that ministry. At St. Peter's things have been relatively steady, but there's a lot of scope to grow and so that's why we look to start something new, a new evening congregation, try and kickstart some momentum, gather in a core team to make that happen. Now in terms of online church, the numbers have been pretty consistent, which is great, and we can see about 240 views every Sunday at our St. Martin's and St. Peter's congregations. We've been getting over 30 kids at our kids' Sunday morning Zoom meetings before they go off to online church while the adults watch the 10 a.m. church. And I've been so encouraged hearing about the, the good numbers of people connecting through the growth groups, virtual morning teas and during the week. So how have we been developing systems and the processes for moving people along this discipleship pathway. Connect, grow, serve, share, glorify. Well, Heather and Brody have been looking at our systems for Connect, welcoming, integrating newcomers, and they now have clear ways for newish people to be followed up, to connect it in, and to train our welcoming teams to take on this responsibility so that we really make an impact with newcomers as they join us. Uh, we're going to introduce a belonging course to help newcomers understand what it means to be a member of our church and so they can see how they can serve God with us. Michael Callahan's going to be looking after the growth groups and grow portfolio with Heather, facilitating every member growing in their faith. So we've got our daily devotions, our growth groups. We've been running our parenting course. We've got 20 couples signed up, which is awesome. We've had our CCL events. And we're looking soon at the opportunity, reading through a book together. There are lots of opportunities for people to connect and to grow. I'm working on Serve with each team member, and we have plans in place to run more training once we can meet up again. And one of the exciting things that we hoped partnership would enable us to do is to prepare people to go out into full-time ministry through ministry traineeships like MTS. Praise God, we're looking at having our first MTS trainee starting next year. In terms of share, we're currently running the online Tough Questions course. We've got a great group joining in there. And we're all set to launch the live course for next year, which will be our go-to course to welcome in newcomers, to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. And then we'll follow that up with a firm foundations course so that people can commit to following Jesus. And Mus is looking at developing all those things as well as connecting us with our mission partners how good was it to have the Blackwells a few weeks ago? In terms of Glorify, uh, what we're working at is in putting together an engaging online experience as much as we can, trialling new innovations like the dedicated Q&A today. We want to try those things out to keep encouraging one another. And finally, our Bishop Chris Edwards, he's also been really supportive behind the scenes. I've asked him to come and speak to us next week. I mean, this was going to be a combined celebration of our partnership service, uh, but because of lockdown, it's going to have to be online church next week, but it's still going to be awesome. Looking forward to that. You know, actually, I've loved the way we've been able to bring our congregations together to combine our ministries and our church 
in online church together. And to see the kids coming together, that's been great. Please do pray for patience uh, as we keep working through the partnership process. Pray for wisdom as we seek to to lead us lead through this. Pray that we'd honour God, that we'd engage and listen well. Pray for our parish councils and our wardens and our ministry team as we work through the partnership process together. And keep praying for the lost as we reach out to the 15,000 people living in Kalara and East Linfield and all the other people in the suburbs around, that they would find new life in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, please bless our growing partnership as we seek to make and mature disciples of Christ. By your spirit, enable us to glorify you in all we do. Connect us deeply to Jesus and one another. Grow us in maturity and Christ-likeness as we serve others sacrificially with the gifts you've given us and share the gospel and love of Christ in our community and all the world. Amen. Hi, everyone. Uh, My name is Jasmine, and I'm going to be leading us in prayer today. So please join with me as I pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, great is your name and most worthy of praise. Your greatness no one can fathom. In perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things. You are a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm, a shade from the heat. Lord, we come before you with the heaviness of the world on our hearts. We pray for the people of Afghanistan, especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ there and in surrounding countries and camps. We pray for rest, refuge, peace and protection for those living in fear, for women and girls living in uncertainty. We pray for courage for Christians that they would know and grasp hold of the hope they have in Christ at this time. And we pray for wisdom for international leaders to respond with compassion and justice. We pray for the rising number of people being vaccinated. And we pray that you would keep those safe who are deciding to be vaccinated and for wisdom for those distributing the vaccine that all would have access. We pray for the lockdown that we're in, for those feeling vulnerable, lonely, at risk of abuse, for the stress and weight on those in the medical and educational systems. Lord, we bring them before you and we pray that you would help us all to trust in you and navigate what it looks like to trust in you during this lockdown. We pray that you would spiritually grow your church in this time, that as your children we will be drawn to you whilst we spend more time at home and that you would challenge us to look for and find opportunities to share the hope and love of Jesus to a world searching for it. We pray for year 12s around the state and country finishing trials, that you would sustain them and fill them with a sense of peace amongst the chaos and motivation amongst the uncertainty. Lord, you command us, invite us to pray to you in all seasons and to bring our cares to you. And so we bring all these prayers said aloud and in our hearts to you, trusting and knowing that you are righteous and faithful in all you do. May you draw near to those who call on you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We're the Vale family, uh, Anna, Brad and Marcus. And we uh, ordinarily go to the 10 a.m. service at Kalara. We're going to read the Bible for you today. But first I thought I'd just mention the things that we are thankful for despite being in this lockdown. Because we have this beautiful bush that you can see. Um, it's spring and the freezers are out and the birds the birds are singing. So that's what we're being particularly thankful for at the moment and bike riding. Um, so without further ado, Brad will read from Luke 2 chapters 22 to 35. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit 
that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the customs of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Thank you, Brad. Now, Marcus will read from Acts chapter 13, verses 44 to 49. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered him boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The Lord of the Lord... The word of the Lord spreads through the whole region. Thank you, Marcus. Bye. Well, please grab your Bibles as we turn again to the book of Isaiah. We're in Isaiah chapter 45. We're continuing our series, Behold Our God, and we come to the second of the servant songs. So read with me Isaiah 49 from verse 1. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples, from afar. The Lord called me from the womb and the body of my mother. He named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favour I answered you, in a day of salvation I have helped you, I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritage, to say to the prisoners, come out, to those in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways on all the bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them and by springs of water he'll guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road and my highway shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar and behold these from the north and from the west and these from the land of Syene. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. It's a great passage, isn't it? Well, Pilgrim's Progress is a story about the journey of a character called Christian, a man who's seeking his salvation on a pilgrimage to heaven. And along the way, Christian encounters many obstacles that test his faith, as well as many characters. 
told as a dream. This 17th century classic uses Bible verses mixed with allegorical characters to tell its message. You know, Christian, he sets out on a journey to save his soul. He leaves behind his friends and his family in the city of destruction and follows the advice of his spiritual guide evangelist in order to reach the celestial city. And the entire tale is told as a journey between Christian's hometown, the city of destruction, and the path of the celestial city. And in between, there are valleys, there are mountains, there are temptations that can mar the easy path to Christian's ultimate uh, destruction. His first obstacle is a slough of despair, uh, he, he encounters all these different characters. After fighting a monster named Apollyon and winning, he comes to the valley of the shadow of death where he is full of sheer terror. He meets faithful there and they become friends and they help each other out during the trip along the valley. And they arrive at Vanity Fair where they're tempted by a myriad of things, all immoral and material. And you know, 10 weeks of lockdown, I feel we're on a journey, which at times has felt challenging and hopeless and You know, we've all felt that. And how do we navigate this? Well, like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, Israel are on this journey. They're facing obstacles. They're facing temptations. Many have turned away from God to idols. And their situation in every way seems hopeless. And yet the mysterious figure we were introduced to last week, the servant, he's going to turn things around. Last Sunday, chapter 42, we saw the servant of God was going to be the one with God's spirit upon him. He was going to come and bring justice for Israel, vindication, uh, which is a big call when you think about how things actually are at the time. Uh, This is a nation whose glory has come and gone, a people in exile in Babylon in the north. Uh, They're the new world superpower that's marched down, that's trampled Israel into the dust, herded up the survivors, marched them back to slavery in Babylon. And Jerusalem, think about it. Their old home left a pile of rubble overgrown with stinging nettles and blackberry bushes. You know, there was a song by Boney M back in 1978 that summed it up. They, they took the words from the Old Testament book of Lamentations, which is a lament written about this situation. By the rivers of Babylon, there we wept when we remembered Zion. There's nothing for Israelites in exile to do but cry to weep about how things are. It's over. It's it's a lost cause. Just imagine for a minute, Israel, they're a spent force. And yet in this second servant song, here in Isaiah chapter 49, the servant speaks and addresses in verse 1 the nations, the the distant islands, including Australia. (laughs) In bold words, the servant speaks. And the first thing we learn, the light shines to the whole world. Like the mouse that roared. I mean... Who is this servant? When you think about it, the opportunity to address the nations doesn't come up all that often. You get guys like the sign language interpreter. Do you remember this? At Nelson Mandela's memorial service, pretending he knows sign language when he gets on stage with Barack Obama, addressing the world. (laughs) How do you pull that off? But other than that, it's not easy to address the nation. I mean, you can post on Facebook You can get a few likes, you can post on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok maybe, you'll go viral. But this servant in the midst of the exile says this, Listen to me, you islands, hear this, you distant nations. This is an international announcement. And somehow the servant expects we're listening, even here in Sydney, Australia today. And he speaks with an incredible sense of destiny. Of his part, somehow in history, he says, Before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. He's spoken my name. Same in verse 5. He who formed me in the womb to be his servant. See, God's been planning this and shaping this before the servant was shaped in his mother's womb. And this servant is going to be a word weapon. You see that in verse 2? Don't be fooled by the military metaphors. He's not going to be a soldier in the usual way, but with his words. You know, Napoleon Bonaparte apparently said, there's only two powers in the world, the sword and the mind. And at the end, he said, the sabre is always defeated by the mind. Which is why they say the pen is mightier than the sword. Words and persuasion of the heart change things more than violence does. And this servant in verse 2 is God's hidden weapon, a polished arrow, a sharpened sword, but not of sharpened steel, but of sharpened words. 
And here's what God has done. It's there in verse 2. The servant says, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword. He's going to come with words, a teacher, and his words are going to have a profound effect. This servant is this mysterious figure, but we learn more and more about the servant in each of the servant songs. And they're such powerful words that cut to the heart. But it does get confusing a bit here. It gets a bit tricky to work out who this servant actually is. But in the next few verses, we get to the heart of it, because maybe much to your disappointment, if you rush to the easy answer that the servant is Jesus and it's simple and you, well, you just need to slow down a bit, because in verse 3, it kind of seems like the servant is a personification, a representative of the nation of Israel. It kind of messes with your head, don't worry, because a couple of verses later, it's going to mess with your head again. God said to me, you are my servant, Israel in whom I will display my splendor. And yet somehow not all Israel is the servant because Israel's in ruins. The the people Israel, they're in Babylon. They're not splendid in any way. They're not showing God's splendor to to anyone. And so he says in verse 4, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing at all, yet I've got what I deserve from God. See, look, I'm not going to say this is simple to get because when you get to verse 5, it gets turned all over again. Remember, we're trying to figure out who this servant is. And before you hit verse 5, just a note, Jacob. Jacob is the tribal ancestor who changed his name to Israel. Jacob, Israel, same guy. So Jacob and Israel in verse 5, they're parallel. So figure this out. Having just been told the servant is Israel, now the servant's going to gather up Israel and put back the pieces. See, read it carefully. And now the Lord says, He who formed me, in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honoured in this eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. You see, here's the problem. Verse 3, the servant is Israel. Two late verses later, the servant's going to gather Israel. So how do we put this together? Well, the servant is going to be what Israel was meant to be. The servant is the real deal. The servant is going to get right what the nation of Israel got wrong. The servant's going to be the real Israel to restore Israel, a faithful Israel who keeps trusting God no matter what, who lives in obedience no matter what. That's what Israel was meant to be all along. And in the end, there's going to be a true Israel to bring things back together. And even if in the end, it's going to be an Israel of just one person. In spite of appearances, God says his servant, his true Israel is going to put them back together again. And there's more. Verse 6, God says, you think that sounds crazy. Bringing back Israel is not enough. The second thing we see is a new people arise. You see, it's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I've kept. Get this next bit at the end of verse 6. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth that this broken, exiled little Israel is not only going to be put back together, but the servant who comes to do that, he's going to light up the world and his salvation is going to go to the ends of the earth. I love the way Barry Webb, a commentator, puts it. The first essential is for them to be reminded that there's a whole world out there that's waiting to hear the truth about God. How's that going to happen? I mean, speaking historically, how could you ever expect little crushed Israel to amount to anything, let alone this? Well, through this faithful servant, this one who's going to speak to the nations. Have a look at verse 7. There's an even more vivid hint of what's coming. This is what the Lord says to the servant. How's it going to go? You're going to be hated. You're going to be rejected. Look at the words. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, Israel's going to hate you even while you save them. But then, astonishing again, somehow the Lord says, kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. And then this beautiful picture in verse 8. In the time of my favour, in the day of salvation, I'll help you. You'll be a covenant for the people. The blind will see. The prisoners will be freed. Friends, that's Jesus. That's the New Testament gospel that resonates with cross-references back to these passages here in Isaiah. 85 times through the New Testament, 
Everyone's saying this is about Jesus of Nazareth, one man on his own, being everything Israel was meant to be. See those words in verse 6? It's too small to just put the tribes of Israel back together. I'm going to make you a light to the nations, people like us. And then, of course, Simeon, the old man in the temple who sees the baby Jesus, praises God and says in Luke 2, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory glory for your people Israel. The world's been waiting for this one, this Jesus to come. And as the story unfolds, we see this including us. As Jesus taught crowds gathered, drawn by his penetrating words, cutting sharp to the heart. Jesus of Nazareth, the servant, taught in a way like no one else. He takes Isaiah as his playbook and says, this is me. In musical terms, it's like the gospel accounts are Isaiah's servant transposed into the key of Jesus. And as he's rejected and abhorred and put to death on a cross, looking like an absolute zero, God delivers on his promise and raises him up to be the ultimate hero, honoured and ruled by kings throughout the nations. Who'd have thought that out of a wrecked little nation two and a half thousand years ago would come this today? And the, the fact is Jesus has passed the servant's role onto his people. You and me, if we're Christians, as Barry Webb says, healing begins when we stop focusing on ourselves and our arguments with God and start looking outward to the world that he loves and needs to know about him. It's what we see in Acts 13. Paul and Barnabas, they're preaching in the synagogue. It goes badly. The Jews are up in arms. And then Paul says, Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first. And since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. This is what the Lord has commanded us. I've made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. He's He's quoting Isaiah 49. Except now the light shining servant is them and us. And with the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth. And you know what? That's why I love verse 48 there. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honoured the word of the Lord and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. You see, Paul and Barnabas and now you and me, we're meant to light up this world, not with fairy lights, but with our lives, with our, with our words, and most especially with the word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword. And the commission Jesus gave his people was to make disciples of all nations, to see those around come to grow him in maturity in him, to know him and to grow in him. And so we present the gospel in prayerful dependence on the Spirit as God's people persistently over time. That's the four Ps that we are engaged in. That's God's mission and we're a part of it. And I'm convinced More than ever, we need to keep digging deep into each of these four Ps, to keep taking the next step in maturity, asking, how can we bring God's grace to our world? What's the next step for me? What's the next step for you? In the presentation of the word, how how can you and I be more ambitious for people in our church to grow in knowledge, in spiritual wisdom, through a profound understanding of the doctrines of faith and prayer, How can you and I keep making progress in prayer and depending on God? With people, if we believe that all disciples have a ministry of the word to others, what can each of us do to teach, encourage, equip, mobilize our members in persistence? Because all culture change requires that patience, planning, constant innovation and honest review. Are you prepared to trust the means God's given us to dig in for the long haul? Because as we do, The good news is that God has a habit of blessing the unremarkable, the obvious, the things that the world and our hearts tell us are least likely to succeed. You see, the third thing we learn in Isaiah 49 is that the heavens rejoice. Ultimately, discipleship leads to worship. Isaiah 40 verse 13, Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult. O earth, break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. 
the shout of praise in verse 13 is the hurrah, mission accomplished. The whole earth rejoices. And by the time we reach that point, the theme of comfort for the people of God, it's no longer just focused on the captives in Babylon. It's a word for us. It's a word that extends to the ends of the earth. It's the word that we need. It speaks into our journey as we take the next step in discipleship, in maturity, so we ultimately rejoice in God. Don't just be part of the four Ps of God's mission. The goal is wholehearted, all of life worship. And if you're inclined to be despondent as you seek to reflect and shine the light, just remember like Paul and Barnabas, there'll be plenty of times when you'll be rejected. But there will be times you won't be, so keep at it. Because when God says so, you'll see it happen. And he's still bringing people on that salvation journey. And so the ones appointed for eternal life, ones like you and me, when, like when we first heard it, we'll be glad. And they, those who hear it, they'll honour the word of the Lord. They'll believe, they'll be comforted, they'll rejoice. So this week, let's pray that we'll be doing that, that we will be the light God has called us to be as we walk on that journey, that God would turn our laments to praise, that we'll worship him with our whole life and ultimately rejoice in him. Amen.
was surely sealed until he rescued us, his death for all of our sin. From slavery and shame, we are redeemed. Yeah, it's a fantastic song. It's an oldie but a goodie. And what a great reminder today from Matt as he brought us the word. God's servant speaks and the light shines to the whole world, not just the Jews, but to the Gentiles, to to the ends of the earth. He is the one who brings comfort and salvation to all people. Jesus Christ's love has made a way. The grave is overcome. What a blessing it's been to join together online today. Although it's a bit different, we thank the Lord for technology. Yeah, absolutely. And so that leads us straight into what we hope is going to be a really encouraging time to do the question and answer, the Q&A just after this. I'll put the Zoom link and the slider link in the chat now in case you have missed it. But make sure, get your questions in there. It's going to be a fantastic time. We hope to see you in two seconds. The staff is praying for you. We'll see you soon, guys.